Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. I'm Henry. I'm Danny. I'm Kagan. We're three leftist veterans that aim to expose the reality of the U.S. military's multiple wars abroad and to illuminate the damage military service does to Americans. American presidents throughout U.S. history have used American military and diplomatic power to force regime change of democratically elected governments around the world. Most veterans come from families vested in prior service, and American generals choose their own, ensuring diversity of thought never interferes with American warmongering. How can we stand by and do nothing while our military kills and destroys lives the world over, while telling Americans that all this death and destruction protects them from terrorists when nothing could be more false? Fortress on a Hill aims to change that. Spencer Ackerman, welcome to Fortress on a Hill. Thank you for coming to chat with me today. Thanks for inviting me, Henry. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, really excited to talk to you. Um, just give a, a quick bio here for everybody. Um, you're a uh, contributing editor at the Daily Beast. Um, from 2017-2021, you were uh, a national, uh, senior national security correspondent for the Daily Beast. And of course, today we're talking about your, your new book, Reign of Terror, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump. Um, you also are a, uh, a former national security editor at Guardian, and that uh, you were on the Pulitzer Prize winning team uh, covering Ed, uh, Edward Snowden's revelations. Um, so I, I, I wanted to take today to kind of hone in on veterans a little bit more. Um, I took, you know, I've been covering, I've been watching lots of your interviews and then different subjects being brought up. Um, the two best I would would definitely say was your, your spot on what a hell of a way to die with uh, Nate Francis and um, your discussion with Ezra Klein. I found those really powerful, really illuminating that, that the, um, you know, it's, it's, it's always easy when somebody comes at you as, as a, as the fair broker and, and actually is willing to have that conversation that most Americans uh, don't have. So I wanted to start with talking a little bit about uh, untrooping. And uh, that was something you talked about on, on what a hell of a way to die quite a bit and discussing um, Edward Snowden, uh, Chelsea Manny. Um, I found it, I found it so powerful and moving um, when you, in your book, describing what happened to her as torture, that we, we, we've we gotten that out of our minds, how horrible our penal system is, and especially for people going so through something like that. Um, definitely uh, an example of the punishment by process that um, other people like Julian Assange have had to go through. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the, the war criminal angle and about how some of those guys uh, ended up getting untrooped, uh, you know, through no fault of their own. But I um, talked a lot about uh, Clint Lawrence, about his uh, his career, his times, his you know the things the things that he went went through, um, and that you know the the kinds of betrayal that we're willing to acknowledge generally don't come from those kind of things when, you know, a, a whole, you know, squad or platoon of soldiers gets sold out by their leader and he ends up, you know, getting pardoned and gets to go on Fox News and talk about all this stuff um, while his soldiers are are maligned and, and treated like shit in the media enough so much that uh, one of them ended up having to change their name. I'm curious what um, what uh, what about the you know the post 9/11 era people that have been convicted of war crimes? What has it pointed out to you? What is the um, you know between the the Trump era between you know mo uh, movement towards more extremism? Um, what is that uh, what does that shown to you, Spencer? Mostly, it shows you how <clears throat> the war on terror understands uh, war crimes. Um, a war crime is not a policy. It's a deviation from a policy. So, um, you know, here's what, you know, one example, um, we're talking a couple days after uh, General Ray Odierno passed away. Um, Odierno, um, probably your listeners don't need 
um, any reminder, um, but for anyone who doesn't know, Odierno was the Army Chief of Staff. Uh, before that, um, he ran the uh, final phase of the occupation of Iraq. He was um, the Corps Commander uh, for David Petraeus during the surge. And before that, on his first tour um, in Iraq, uh, he ran the 4th Infantry Division. What did he do when he ran the 4th Infantry Division? Um, <clears throat> basically, uh, the 4ID uh, used extremely brutal measures to uh, attempt to pacify uh, Western Iraq. So um, someone like uh, Lieutenant Colonel Nate Sassaman, uh, who was um, you know, such a golden boy in the Army, he was a West Point quarterback, um, Odierno um, allowed Sassaman uh, to, you know, exert dominance over his battle space by informing um, citizens of entire towns that they were under strict curfew, uh, that they could uh, come and go at the pleasure of the military. Um, and uh, if they defied orders that were issued to them in English only, they could be shot. Um, that was an acceptable thing um, for, um, for a commander to order um, during the Iraq War. Um, what, you know, we see as unacceptable um, are people who, you know, through all fault of their own, I don't want to, you know, say for a second uh, that you know, their crimes are not the result of choices they make. But, you know, someone like Clint Lawrence is taking an important cue about how the war and his superior officers view the disposable, uh, how disposably um, his commanders view, um, in his case, Afghan lives. Um, I think Lawrence you know, shows himself to be a coward by not just the way he perceives those lives to be uh, so indisposable, but also how, you know, he orders soldiers under his command for, I think, what was it, like two, three days um, to become executioners, to become criminals themselves. Um, you know, there's, there's not really, you know, Certainly, we can, you know, point out simultaneously um, that the war's systematic um, destruction um, and sort of deep dehumanization of people's lives are, um, you know, an all-encompassing backdrop. While you know, tons and tons of you know commanders, certainly you know junior officers, certainly lieutenants you know, don't make uh, the decisions that Lawrence makes, right? So I think there we see both the interplay of what's structurally at work and the um, uniqueness of the choices that people make for which they are responsible. Um, the war on terror doesn't punish people um, above, you know, particular ranks. Um, it views, it views, Someone like, um, you know, Robert Bales, uh, who murders, um, I think, something uh, 15, 16 um, Afghan men, women, and children um, as, uh, you know, the, the basest deviation um, from, uh, from the war on terror. Um, and while he certainly is a deviation for good order and discipline and um, every aspect and more of his punishment he deserves, um, the, the war on terror, generally the military institutionally, um, cannot uh, draw the parallels uh, that are necessary in recognizing that the policies it pursues um, are the problem here. Uh, the policies it pursues um, are not just a problem for, you know, and this is something you, 
you very often hear from um, liberal criticism, um, that they are problems because they make things worse for the military. No, they're problems because of the overwhelming danger they pose to people's lives. And ultimately, you do that to enough people, um, and some small amount of them are going to seek revenge, and some smaller part of them are even going to achieve it. I think I think the most disturbing thing about Lawrence's case, and I think, and I also think this ties into the military's uh, legal response to it, was that had had he just ordered his men to kill those innocent Afghans, it wouldn't have been something I don't think that would have been made as big a deal of that the moment he started telling his troops to lie to specifically, we will write this report the right way. We'll do, you know, that, that, that we're, we're going to do this, that there was a, it was a different problem for them. You know, it was, a, it was, they, they, I don't think that the death and destruction um, mattered as much as, as what he was doing under the, under the surface there with his, with his troops. And especially that, he had been working previously at the one of the I think his battalion HQ working Intel, so he was very close to lots of people who would end up filing those kind of reports. Hmm. I'm not I'm not saying it's acceptable in the least, but I I think that it was as as morbid as it sounds that having his troops murder people wasn't the biggest thing for him. Um, but then again, it did only come a matter of months after what Robert Bales did. It was and it was in the same very close to the same region in Afghanistan. So there may have already been that underlying tension with that. And and Bales was, I think, was, you know, he's certainly of the war on terror era is the most egregious war criminal we've seen. And there was there never was a campaign for him to be pardoned. But these other lesser murderers, lesser liars um, can slide in there a, a little bit easier. You know, when you were talking about on troop um, and you started talking about Lawrence, my thoughts turned um, to Eddie Gallagher, um, someone else uh, who his fellow SEALs not only turn in, not only seek to testify against, and those of us um, who've covered the special operations community can just see how rare that is, like, especially considering, like, you know, it's not exactly a secret that the SEALs have done some noxious shit. And like other members of the soft community, you know, you know, cough, Delta, cough, um, you know, can, you know, tear their hair out about what the SEALs have, have gotten away with. And, um, you know, I have yet to read um, David Phillips' book, Alpha. Um, okay. So uh, I'm really looking forward um, to the, you know, depth of reporting on Gallagher, but the way in which Gallagher... Um, just absolutely um, lays in to all of his fellow SEALs who are testifying like using terms like evil to describe Gallagher. Um, he is trying to perform a kind of untrooping. He is trying to make sure that he is the embodiment um, for a lot of people of naval special warfare, of being a SEAL. Um, and you know, given that, you know, I, I consider it likely only a matter of time before Gallagher engages in politics, it's going to be revealing to see um, not only how that development unfolds, but who goes along with it and who challenges it. I, uh, I had Gallagher on my, my notes here, and it's it, um, thinking about him. Um, reminded me of something that I, I um, you, you touched on it briefly in the book, but it was about how um, how our country and how the national security state has come to view civilians on the battlefield and the use of the term human shields. Um, you know, like in the campaign with ISIS, we knew that, you know, there, there was, there's lots of evidence to say that that did happen. But for us to coin all of the people remaining in Mosul who are not combatants or ISIS as simply ending up being, being, uh, you know, just pawns of what's happening there. 
some of them are i'm sure sure some of them are trapped and that isis had had part to do with it but in terms of the 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 lack of nuance in, in discussing that um and of course the the human shields thing takes on an entirely different outlook looking in uh, a place like gaza um yeah. but back back to eddie gallagher for a second that <clears throat> that the special operations campaigns during the war with ISIS that they didn't take prisoners. They just didn't. And that's that's one thing that we don't discuss very often about what do our special forces allow proxy forces to do on their behalf and exactly how ugly that is that that, that they end up, you know, and um, and like you said about Gallagher is that it's oh my God, it's such a it's such a oddity that his men, that the people he served with were willing to go past that wall of silence, which is much, much thicker compared to, you know, more ordinary military silence to demean his fellow SEALs, even though they felt that they were doing the right thing. But I wonder if in the SEALs mind, like you mentioned about their many, their many crimes, um, is that something that they can even notice, let alone do something about? Mosul in general, I think is, just in a, you know, a, a glaringly conspicuous um, phenomenon where it's under covered. Um, just like this was a something like nine month long urban battle. Like, you know, when you, you know, when looking, when taking a kind of longer view of military history, you know, a nine month battle to take like a large city isn't particularly unusual um, in, in like the broad, you know, scheme of things. But in the last, you know, two generations of American warfare, it has been. Um, and it's, you know, unique um, in the war on terror. Um, what's also conspicuous about it is that because it was accomplished um, along the dock, you know, um, along the doctrine of by, with, and through, which is to say, you know, in the air and went on the ground through proxy forces whenever possible. Um, unlike um, urban combat during the occupation of Iraq, it was extremely difficult to get, you know, embedded uh, with U.S. and Iraqi forces. Um, you know, most of the reporting, certainly the good reporting, um, done out of the Battle of Mosul was typically um, unembedded. And, you know, at tremendous, tremendous risk, those of us who have done both embedding and unembedded reporting know, um, to those people bringing us that news. Um, but, you know, with notwithstanding, you know, we could talk about this all day, um, the problems inherent in doing military embedded reporting, the alternative in the case of Mosul was that we just don't know nearly as much as we should about the way this extremely arduous battle unfolded um, with, you know, I couldn't even tell you the, the stats without Googling them, but, you know, Mosul, I've been to Mosul. Um, it, you know, it's an enormous city um, fighting through it uh, especially through its density, um, is, is just, you know, a, a very, a task horrifying to contemplate. And the fact that we don't know so much about something like this, that is, you know, quite possibly going to be, um, you know, a template for war in the future. I'm not saying it will, I'm saying it could, um, with a lot of people's conceptions about what urban warfare is developing into, um, is a really disturbing thing. Um, I, you know, remember, um, I think General Townsend, who was in um, command of um, the Iraq-Syria war against ISIS um, at the time, is is quoted in a piece that I cite in the book, saying that like this is the most intense urban combat that the U.S. has engaged in since Vietnam. And, you know, I think he might have even said not, not just urban, but like industrial conflict, uh, which is a really tremendous thing um, to wrap your head around. Um, and it is in that environment 
um, that I think about the ways in which the SEALs who are, you know, tasked with carrying out a tremendous amount um, against uh, the Islamic State in Mosul um, would then look at Gallagher, who seems like to take enjoyment um, in inflicting this kind of brutality. Um, you know, the story that he couldn't get prosecuted for because there's no body um, was that he was like taking shots when he would see women in hijab. Um, and I think, you know, you don't, you don't really have to go very far to recognize how wrong that is. Like you can see that when it happens and people, particularly like SEALs in a circumstance as wretched as, you know, Mosul was as wretched as every other deployment um, of so many that they would have been tasked with over their career as SEALs who try and act in a valorous way in those circumstances can see something uh, very dangerous about Gallagher, not only um, dangerous um, to the human beings um, that he is targeting, but dangerous um, to those he would fight alongside and dangerous to the institution um, that many of them really do take, um, you know, very personally. So, um, I really enjoyed your your breakdown on John Kelly um, with with uh, Nate and Francis, and I wanted to ask you, and this is just kind of curiosity for me, but the it it really seems that John Kelly's, you know, I mean, it's, it's certainly more refined than this, but that he is almost a walking Vietnam syndrome in some ways. That the the things that he envisions in terms of that, you know, if we, if we didn't, you know, pull the boys out or not give them enough, you know, whatever. And granted, his is a little more specific in, in terms of that anybody who insufficiently supports a conflict or who actually attempts to oppose it. Of course, this is a situation where someone like him would respond much worse to a, a veteran like me who wants to change the national security state versus other more typical people that just go out and, and be Americans. And that's one of the biggest, th biggest things with veterans is that most veterans come home and that's what they do. They try to go on living their lives and, and that shouldn't be a, a problem except for what is left, what is left in the wake of, of that time spent, what is left in the wake of a, a four-year enlistment for somebody that, you know, they, they were supp supply or they were a, a medical job or whatever it is, but at some point in there, they were involved in the chain to take violence to a specific place at a you know for for a specific reason whatever that however vague um, that happens to be. I think you know I remember when you know Kelly gives that speech in St. Louis in 2010 where he's ventriloquizing these two Marines who are killed at a checkpoint um, in order to tell a story that holds civilian America in contempt. Um, and I remember thinking that like, there's a version of this that like I've heard a lot um, from veterans that like isn't as caustic, that's like much on one hand more searching about finding meaning um, in their war. And on the other hand, um, less enthusiastic about the war itself. Um, you know, I when when you find a you know a war on terror veteran um who has like very uncomplicated pro-war feelings, um A, that's a unicorn. I don't like know very many. Um and B, like red flag after red flag after red flag, right? right. Like that's what is up with that. Um, so I remember thinking that while at the same time, like the frustration with like most of the country, not on the one hand, really ha having any idea of what soldiering in these wars was, but on the other hand, being like pretty certain that they actually do have some idea. Um, like that's pretty frustrating. And like, 
I like I can recognize that as someone who didn't serve but has like been to like Iraq and Afghanistan, right? Sure. Um, and so I remember thinking back, you know, Kelly's thing is that like it wasn't going to take root. Like it was the sort of thing that I think a lot of us were looking at it, you know, if we you know paid it much attention at the time, I think most in the media, um, we just didn't um, for a variety of reasons, most importantly being that like everyone gave Kelly a tremendous amount of, you know, birth to grieve. This was so soon after um, his son dies in action um, in Afghanistan. Um, but nevertheless, you know, I think when we did look at it, we were looking at it as like a trend story, you know, something that we were like, is this the way, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, veterans of this generation, you know, feel and they are going to develop that feeling. And, you know, after Kelly goes to work for Trump, it occurs to me that that was entirely the wrong way to go about looking at Kelly. It wasn't at all about what that speech said to veterans. It was about what that speech said to civilians. And it was useful for a, a political current like Trump and MAGA to say that um, the military is a Praetorian guard its position um, in uh, the country is a sacred one and allegiance to it um, is to be determined by allegiance to an enterprise, not by the way you could, you know, alternatively view it, you know, keeping fidelity um, by materially improving the lives of people who serve in the war like they expect when they go in. You know, like what you never get from presentations like Kelly's and certainly from less caustic presentations, you know, the gauzy ones that you get either from, you know, more, for lack of a better term, like, you know, normie retired general and flag officers or from politicians is that like, you know, these people enlisted because they wanted to serve a cause, you know, higher than self and so forth. And like, that's there and I've seen it. But what gets left out is like, it's also because like you promised them affordable education. And like lots of people who are here when you talk to them candidly are like, I needed a way to pay for college. I needed a way to do all of these other things that the army um, or the Marine Corps or the Air Force or the Marines say that they would, less so the Marines certainly, uh, less that, you know, they will help me out with everything else I want to do with my life that doesn't involve being in the military. Um, and that, I think, is one of the more important ways, um, you know, certainly politically potent ways, um, that uh, the redefinition of fidelity um, and social responsibility to the military um, has moved away from anything having to do with taking care of people, of human beings within it, and toward um, protecting allegiance to a political agenda, um, one that can be very easily manipulated. And that's a really dangerous thing. And Kelly's impact accelerating all of that, I think, is extremely underappreciated. I read, um, read an essay uh, recently by uh, Elliot Ackerman. And he was, uh, it's called uh, turning in my, uh, my veteran card. And I, di I didn't agree with everything he said, but um, in terms of that veteran veneration has done nothing for the cause of veterans as, a, as taking care of them in, in those ways. I mean, there's a, there's a very shiny veneration that we give at NFL games and other, other such bullshit, but we don't... Um, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't lift up veterans at all. And it's, of course, it certainly doesn't lift up the um, victims of um, U.S. imperialism. But um, so I wanted to move on to uh, talk a little bit about some of the effects on veterans between um, between, let's say, you know, Timothy McVeigh's time and, and now um, that in us talking about, you know, Eddie Gallagher, you know, that the, you know, Timothy McVeigh went from someone who received super glowing reviews for his time in the military 
to becoming someone who was comfortable and, and committed mass murder. And I, you know, Eddie Gallagher has got to be um, right there with him, but so much of the reality of, I don't know about Eddie Gallagher yet, but Timothy McVeigh has been cooked out of the story. You know, I didn't know until I read Catherine Ballou's book, the, the Bring the War Home, that his connections to white supremacy, I, I had never known about any of that. And it, it gives this much more complete picture of what he was. Um, so that brings us to, you know, January 6th and the military trying to respond to extremism. And so what I'm wondering from you, Spencer, is, you know, you've, you, you've written about many topics about veterans, about the national security state. And in terms of your experiences, your writing, is there actually space for veterans these days to find an actual sense of honor that in terms of in terms of the mission, in terms of the what what is cost, if if let's say if reading Reign of Terror was a primer to joining, you know, military or intelligence service, and I'm using the term service and honor pretty loosely here, how can a veteran find positive meaning among a system where where murder, where torture, secrecy, betrayal are the are um not even the exceptions, but they are the rules, no matter how much they may say that they're not. So that I think is one of the most profound questions um, of the, the entire war on terror. Um, I can't presume to answer it. I can't presume to answer it for anyone else. I can't presume to answer it um, as someone who didn't soldier in, in these wars. I think that is a challenge that like thoughtful people are going to either take up or they're going to try and avoid um, and rely on um, kind of all the kind of lazy ways uh, that uh, a pretty much otherwise indifferent society just wants to say like, oh yeah, you're a hero. And like, just, you know, give you your Applebee's discount and, you know, kind of move on. Um, I think about a story I tell um, in the book that I saw um, in 2008 in Afghanistan, um, which was uh, someone who I call Sergeant Rob. Um, it's not particularly difficult to figure out who that is um, if you have Google. Um, but uh, I watched Sergeant Rob, um, who was um, the platoon sergeant during... Um, for a cavalry troop um, I accompanied um, in 2008 on a mission to hunt down a weapons cache and get um, a Taliban uh, arms fencer. Um, what ended up happening during that raid was um, Afghan police sought to rob um, the women who were living in the compound that got raided. And, you know, this is a, a real dicey circumstance, you know, in that moment, because on the one hand, um, the police are uh, like very necessary partners uh, for that cavalry troop. They have to work through the police, um, according to their ROE. Um, they, according also to um, rules set in place by um, the Afghan Ministry of Defense, and at that time, the president's office. Um, simultaneously, um, you know, the police are robbing people, like, in front of the Americans. And this sergeant has the presence of mind uh, to, in, shall we say, encourage his lieutenant uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, and it happened at direct expense of um, their mission in this case. But I think he ultimately, you know, he would, um, he was killed in action during a subsequent tour um, uh, in Afghanistan. But, you know, during all the time I've spent um, reporting on Iraq and Afghanistan and the rest of the war on terror, that was the only actual act of heroism I ever witnessed. Um, and I say that 
not to be part of this, I think, like, you know, condescending complex of just like finding service members and calling them heroes. But because like this was an actual circumstance um, of moral emergency and of choice. And this person made what I think was an extremely honorable choice, even um, if finding honor came at the expense of a mission that is as you describe. And if I have any way of addressing that question, it's to say that that is a way of making sense of someone's um, time serving um, in a dishonorable war that they had no, that they had, that they like bore no ultimate responsibility for how dishonorable it was, they were thrust into it. Um, but again, like that is a very big question and, you know, an extremely personal one. So I don't know if that answer has been useful at all, but it's, it's, it's as good as I have. Our podcast is supported in a few different ways. First, there's Patreon, where we're blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters, helping the guys and I pay for some of the podcast expenses. Those who contribute $10 a month or more will be mentioned right here as an honorary producer, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes. But you don't have to contribute $10 a month to help us. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help keep us going, paying for hosting and storage fees, transcribing old and new episodes, promoting and expanding the podcast, and more I'm sure I can't think of at the moment. So let's bring out our honorary producers, and they are Will Arends, Fahim Shirazi, James O'Barr, Adam Bellows, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Tristan Oliver, Daniel Fleming, Michael Karen, Zach H., Ren Jacob, Howard Reynolds, Why I Am Anti-War Podcast, Scott Spaulding, Kenneth Cordasco, Korgoth, and the Status Quo Podcast. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you so much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our awesome store on Spreadshirt.com for some great Fortress merch. The link is in the show notes. And now, let's get back to the podcast. Yeah, yeah, no, um, I, these days I suggest to people that if you're going to thank people for their service, that as opposed to using the word service, people could say something along the lines of like, thank you for your sacrifice, because in some way or another, that person did, even if they, you know, were, were in the States at, at um, you know, a, um, for their to, for their time they never deployed or anything like that that we need to look at it in an entirely different way more so at the human cost but separate from that and i think more important than saying something like thank you in any form is that instead of thank you for your service it should first and foremost be tell me about your service yeah and, so, and some veterans may say no they may say they're not comfortable with it and that's fine there's nothing wrong with that but People need to take the deliberate action of saying, I'm not going to accept the phony baloney veteran veneration. I'm going to talk to this veteran and I'm going to let them tell me what it was really like without overly using the words good or bad, just what, what happened to them. And we have to, we have to get away from the mindset because not everybody wants to be venerated, but also is that people need to know that our country should care about what happens to service members. They should care about that damage in a much bigger and expansive way than they do. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, you know, that the, the idea of veneration, it doesn't do veterans any favors 
other than like i said in a very vague flashy nfl on sunday kind of way yeah i mean it it's a tool you know designed to exploit you right like it 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 gives you nothing um it you know, is, is, is forgotten immediately. It's a substitute, you know, something like thank you for your service um, for engagement, which is what it postures as. Like it, it you know, it's, it's almost like table matters. You're getting something out of the way before you move on to the thing that you're trying to get to. Sure. Um, and that's a shitty way to treat people, right? Like that's not... Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, so um, I think from the civilian side something that can happen is that like the post 9-11 culture of veneration like just ends up drawing extremely sharp divides this is what you know kelly kind of wants to embrace um between like who counts as a as 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 a as a true american versus who exists as a conditional american um and you know for a certain sort of person um who doesn't serve um but also like doesn't really have a critique of the war or like much interested in like just goes about like you know living living their life and isn't really concerned by the kinds of questions that you know brought us to this conversation today then like if such a person finds themselves in a circumstance where like they're around a veteran who announces themselves as such that's sort of like the 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 social rules of 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 the of the game right like it it's they're acknowledging something to get out of the way that they have been made to feel a different kind of social inferiority and so they're sort of nodding at a like they're nodding at that order. They're nodding at the expectation that they at that moment are meant to acknowledge that they did not perform such a sacrifice. And now that we've gotten that kind of ritualistic humiliation out of the way, basically like this does no good for anybody. No. Like it's, it's, it's just like an awful arrangement that's entirely unnecessary. Um, but I think we're going to grow more accustomed to, um, as on the one hand, um, the military through like the creation of the all volunteer military um, becomes more of both like a distinct social class and also, as is I think a, a pretty disturbing phenomenon, um, like a uh, kind of family affair not just for officers but for for enlisted people um having just increasingly less and less um interaction um with um kind of america more broadly and then also um america's just straight up devotion to remain to remaining globally hegemonic um which will lead to more and more war So um, I want to uh, I want to make sure I'm, I'm uh, attentive for your time. I know you're a, a really busy guy uh, putting the book out and everything. Um, before I uh, before I close, I had one more question for you, and this is uh, kind of a kind of a Cold War War on Terror comparison, but that the um, where we are right now. This is uh, mid mid October. Uh, we've withdrawn from Afghanistan. We've just had the 20th anniversary of uh, 9/11. I know you are a uh, native New Yorker, uh, still still live there. And so, in uh, my my question is about what about studying the global war on terror really surprised you? What what was the um, what are the what are the hallmarks that reading about in history? that it's going to end up being what do you think the telltale signs are and especially from where we were say you know just just uh, right around you know early 90s 
I think that, um, you know, in context, I'm going to be, I'm working on a, a piece about this to try and draw out the, you know, the Cold War stuff, but um, the way in which the war on terror reflects a lot of second time as farce aspects of the Cold War, where um, a kind of unserious threat inflation of, you know, beyond Al Qaeda to, you know, something, you know, vast and over intellectualized while being a stupid concept um, that becomes known as radical Islamic terror um, becomes for certain classes, um, you know, elite classes of Americans takes on a kind of totemic role comparable to the Soviet Union. And by comparable, I mean, in the sense of like creating out of, um, you know, very thin historical gruel, um, a global capable threat. Um, not just to American lives, but to the American way of life. And like, this is always bullshit, but it also reflects, um, and this is the case probably for, you know, every war, um, it, it reflects how the dominant mode of politics wants to view the Cold War in retrospect as a good and evil story um, where, you know, the good United States and its friends vanquishes the evil Soviet Union um, and its sycophants. Um, and the more you read the Cold War um, as history, um, and the more you read like real histories of the Cold War, like just absolutely none of that resembles reality. Just, ab just none of it. Um, you know, the United States, um, particularly, the, you know, through the CIA, um, but also through the military at times, um, engages in campaigns so bloody that, you know, in, you know, circumstances like Indonesia, they cross over into being like outright genocides. Um, and then, you know, global anti-communism um, sponsored by the United States um, is a force of global destabilization, you know, by design. And it is not strictly a force focused um, on communism, but also against social democracy and also against other forms, um, you know, less, you know, recognizably, um, you know, in a Marxist tradition, um, but in uh, local and syncretic traditions uh, that nevertheless threatens the interests of capital. And that is what the Cold War is. And that is also um, through misremembering and um, whitewashing the Cold War, a way in which the war on terror became truly a forever war, became, you know, something that was sold, you know, through the prism of, you know, American legacy, part of a, uh, a proud tradition of America aiding in the liberation of the world. And now this would happen in the Muslim world. And that story um, is always a bullshit story. Uh, it's always um, a manipulative story. It's always an exploitative story and it's never a true story. Um, but it is a very potent story. Uh, and it's going to be one to look out for when we start seeing um, historical writing about a war on terror that remains ongoing aside from um probably you know uh, china and russia what what calls out to you as a possibility for the next the next nebulous enemy the next you know we're we're, we're slowly moving away from from anti-terrorism and uh you know that that China, I think, would be the the simplest and and probably most obvious uh, one. But um, but again, that the you know China is too specific. China, you know, it it, it if if it is a you know um, if it is focused on China, 
Eh, crap. <laughs> Sorry, but I lost my train of thought. No, don't worry. I can jump in. All right, go for it. Um, you know, I think we may end up seeing a sort of bifurcation where um, elite foreign policy professionals um, have as their primary preoccupation China um, and whatever it is, you know, great power competition um, is going to be cashed out as. Um, but we're also going to, you know, I think in a really disturbing way, um, encounter is another acceleration of a trend that's very visible now. And when you think about it, really does exist throughout all of American history. But nevertheless, we're looking at it right now, which is the increasing normalization of violence as an adjunct to a normal part of politics. This is what goes into the voter suppression. This is certainly what went, you know, what the insurrection was about. Um, and the more normal this becomes, uh, um, the more glaring the bifurcation between like how elites in both parties talk about like the, you know, the great danger China poses um, to the, you know, the outlook of the 21st century. And it's like, well, China doesn't threaten me, but, you know, the guy parading, you know, down the street in, you know, military cosplay, you know, open carrying, um, you know, talking about, um, you know, Jews not replacing him. I kind of think that's the more urgent thing to, you know, deal with and also recognize that, like, a lesson of the war on terror we really ought to keep in mind right now is that we're facing an enormous uh, political challenge in the breakdown of democracy and in the erosion um, of, of a faith that um, politics and violence are opposites um, in, in, in kind of normal discourse, um, which is that uh, political problems can't be solved with security solutions. I, like, I just don't see how uh, a more glaring lesson of the war on terror exists than that. And watching the ways in which we don't really have a political response to January 6th, we have an FBI response to January 6th, um, is, is something that's just very conspicuous to me. So um, I think that's a good spot for us to, uh, to close up uh, the discussion. I wanted to ask you a couple questions about your, your comic interests. You are getting ready to uh, get to write a Suicide Squad comic. I can't tell you how awesome that is, dude. Thank you. Um, no, I, uh, I find that that's one, one area where I find a lot better criticism of the war state is in in comics you know that the 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 original civil war with you know with cap and iron man that that it, okay. there, there were there were actual questions answered there was actually you know that they they really tried to take the the notion of the marvel universe and give it a spread like we had seen coming out from from 9 11. um i had i had wondered have you ever read um avengers endless war time no, I haven't. Which one is that? That one, it's a, it's a graphic novel. It's a one shot. Um, but essentially what happens is that they, um, there's a country that U uh, the U.S. is involved in regime change, change operations and some of their um, hired thugs, I don't know if we, how we want to call that, they shoot down what they think is an American drone and they find out that it's actually connected to a living being. That they're actually that for some fusion of you know mystical and and sci-fi type stuff that these drones they they can create their own bombs that they find their own targets and just just that the the whole idea of a drone big or small becomes endless it just becomes and and the the criticism in the story is is amazing but the the idea that we're and we are we 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 so feed this beast that we don't even understand fully what it damages what it really does we think it protects us because we pay the money and we don't care about it and we don't watch it on the news um 
but it's a, a really powerful story. It's not a terribly long one. I think you'd uh, you'd really dig it. Um, I did want to ask you um, if maybe sometime in the uh, in the future you'd come back and discuss uh, Civil War with me. I would and love to do that. We can. I, we... I reread that one a lot. So yeah, whenever you want to do that, let's do it. That would that would be awesome, dude. It's it's one that I read uh, pretty often as well. I'm rereading um, Spider Man's arc in it and how horribly his whole life gets changed and destroyed because he was trying to make Tony happy, and and it it's just awful to see. But the but the criticism is amazing. They, they you know some stories are just they just you know rise above and really talking about what the actual mood of something is one of the reasons you know that sometimes fiction is better than nonfiction in telling those stories that we can't uh that we can't really get a grasp on so spencer thank you so much for uh, for your time for being here today and also thank you for the reminder that non-veterans are able to see the strings in the puppet show and become angry as the, everybody else pretends that they're invisible and uh, yet essential um, will you tell the, tell the folks where, uh, where they can find your work? Well, thanks very much. Really appreciated this conversation and, uh, looking forward now, uh, to our next one. Um, you can find me, um, on Substack. Um, I write a newsletter, uh, called Forever Wars. Um, for the next little bit, that's going to be, um, the primary place where you can check out my journalism. Um, the book is called Reign of Terror, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump. That's out um, at uh, booksellers everywhere. Um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Attackerman also. Um, and next year, you can uh, find me um, at your comic book shop uh, for the Suicide Squad book that I can't yet fully talk about. It, is, it sounds amazing, dude. I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna pick it up as soon as soon as I possibly can. I uh, I always feel guilty for using Marvel Marvel Unlimited because I, I I don't have comic books. I can't touch them, and you know that I can I can read all of them, but they're not my comic books. Um, so Spencer, thank you, and uh, really look forward to uh, talking to you again in the future. Sam Henry, thanks a lot. Take care. Right. Take care. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also at Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com and if you're not into giving us a monthly payment think about giving us a couple bucks on paypal the link is in the show notes skepticism is one's best armor you never forget people. it we'll see you next time and listen to my song i hope you'll pay attention i will not be tamed